Uh, now, I'm going to talk about number of cases in the beginning, um, though I'm not sure the number of cases is all that meaningful, mm -hmm. because the number of cases is really a function of the number of tests, and our uh, use of testing is not consistent across uh, the states, across the nation, um, or across the world. But so far, we have about 110, uh, 810 thousand cases across the world, increasing at 50 to 75,000 cases a day. Um, in the United States, we have now uh, probably, I have this morning's number, which was 165,000. It's probably now uh, closer to uh, 185,000, because it's going up by about 20,000 a day. Um, I haven't I, th I believe we have very close to 500 cases in Rhode Island, uh, and that's increasing now about 80 cases a day. There have very unfortunately been uh, about 40,000 deaths in the world and uh, well over 3,000 deaths in the United States and eight deaths in Rhode Island. It's the number of deaths that has more meaning, not just emotionally, but uh, you know, that is a scientifically more uh, consistent measure than the number of cases. The good news is there have now been close to 200,000 recoveries, um, reminding everybody that for most people, this is either mild disease or when it's severe, that most people recover. Uh, so that's the basic setup. In Rhode Island, we're not currently experiencing the huge uh, number of cases in the hospital that they are in New York and in Italy and Spain. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and it's hard to know. Uh, I mean, we've, we've got a number of cases in the hospital for sure. Um, but at the moment, I believe only 14 people in intensive care units with COVID. And we have a uh, room for about 180 so at the moment and they're working to expand that number so uh, so we're still doing okay though our numbers are going up every single day right. the thing that's hard to have context in context that's important is the context of seasonal flu remembering that in the United States we have something in the neighborhood of 25 to 40 or 50 million cases of flu every single year and 30 to 60,000 deaths from seasonal influenza every single year. So, you know, though uh, coronavirus looks like it will catch up this year, it's probably going to be three or four times the number of deaths from flu, but not you know, not so many as to be unimaginable. Each one will be painful, um, but it is still in the order of magnitude of influenza, we believe, um, but still it's new to us. And the thing that's different about coronavirus is that because none of us are immune, essentially all of us are gonna get it and some get it sometime in the next likely six to 12 months. Um, and the challenge that we all face is to slow down the speed at which we get it so that not everybody gets sick at once and not everybody ends up in the intensive care unit at once. The risk in terms of excess death is the risk of overwhelming the number of ventilators we have because the people who will die unnecessarily are the people who will die if we don't have enough ventilators for everyone who needs one. Mm -hmm. Even so, we'll lose one to 3% of people with, who get symptoms. But that one to 3% can double if everybody comes at once and we don't have enough ventilators for everyone. Um, and you know, one of the things that's important is to remember what everybody needs to do to control this. And some of this is known, but I think some of this, this is essentially new information for people. Obviously, everyone knows about staying home, about washing your hands every hour, 
about avoiding other people. You know, first they were saying 50, less than 50, and then they were saying less than 20, and then they said less than 10 and less than five. I think the basic rule is, you know, for the moment, stay away from people as much as you can. You know, obviously other than the people you live with. Um, if you're sick, um, now the important news is what to do if you're sick, because we're all gonna get sick from this. The few of us are gonna get seriously sick. But if you're sick, what we want you to do, and what I'm about to say first is, this is what my own suggestion is. I think everybody who's sick needs to put on a mask at home um, and then go into uh, a room and stay alone in that room for about seven days or until three days of no fever um, until you're really getting significantly better. You need to isolate yourself um, or hibernate in a room from even away from your family just by yourself bringing a television and a a bunch of books, mostly a bunch of books, remembering my audience, um, but bringing a bunch of books, uh, you know, some music, uh, uh, a, a laundry basket, because you don't want to be in and out of the room, you know, going to the laundry, going to the laundromat or going to, uh, uh, to the washer and dryer. Um, you want a, a big receptacle for garbage because you want your meals to be dropped off in front of your room by somebody in your family, have them go away, go away from the door, and then pick up your meal on a paper plate, eat on the paper plate, and then throw the paper plate away. And then not have to come out of the room to move garbage around, not have to move, come out of the room uh, to wash the dishes. Um, you know, If you can use a separate bathroom from everyone else, that's better. If you can't, then people need to disinfect and disinfect and disinfect any surface where you've been. Um, but keep a mask on the whole time. Um, <coughs> my suggestion as families prepare is for everyone to either find or make uh, seven masks for each person. So you have one mask for every day that you're in isolation, assuming that you're going to... We're all going to be in isolation uh, for some period. So why don't I stop now and listen for questions? Sounds good. Anyone? And don't forget you have to go to the corner, left-hand corner of the Zoom box and take off the mute button if, if we, in order for us to hear you. Hello. Hello, Catherine. No, it's actually Lori. Hello, though I, Lori. I, though I don't have my screen name that. Um, so I don't know if this is too big of a question per se. It is a serious thing, obviously. But how is it that it's so much more serious than flu or influenza? I can answer that question. Great. Um, most of us have some immunity to influenza. Uh, because we've had it before, because we've had flu shots, one or the other, or both, so that even though the influenza virus changes a little bit every year, we have a, it's, it doesn't change so much that we don't have some residual immunity. And 37% of us get flu shots, so that we have augmented immunity directed at that year's flu, which means in any uh, given year, about 5% of us will get it, um, but 95% of us won't. For uh, coronavirus, we have no immunity. Oh. And so all of us will get it, and you know, close to all of us are getting it at once, which puts extra stress on the, uh, on the hospital system. Yes. Um, that's point one and point two, because we have no immunity, it is much harder for us to fight this virus. You know, the virus itself doesn't seem to do any much more in general than flu does, but it can overwhelm the immune system because we have no immunity to it at all. Now we develop immunity, thank goodness. But <laughs> if you get, uh, it appears that if you get 
what we call a large inoculum. That is a lot of uh, a lot of flu virus at once, a lot of vi viral particles at once. It appears that sometimes uh, those particles can really overtake the immune system and make a mess of the lungs. Um, and that and that seem and that's my guess about why we lose healthcare workers. You know, I can't remember the exact number, but 10 or 11 percent of the deaths in Spain were healthcare workers. Um, and I think it's because of the large inoculum and no pre-existing immunity. I see. Thank you. That's helpful. Hopefully, that addresses the question. So. Okay. At this time, myself and a lot of other people, being the time of the year, seem to be um, experiencing allergy symptoms. Yep. Um, but is it possible we could actually be having a touch of corona, if you will? Or um, I'm going to give you a difficult answer. The unfortunate answer is yes. Okay. We just don't know, and there, you know. The classic symptoms of corona, and I think somebody just asked this uh, in, a, in a chat message, but the classic symptoms of, of corona are fever and cough. And there's some uh, belief that a number of people have GI stuff first, but evolves oh. into fever and cough. And some of us appear to get the loss of smell and taste right oh. before we get hit. Um, but that it's also likely that a fairly substantial number of us are have no symptoms at all, are totally asymptomatic and carry it. Maybe as much as 50% of people who get the disease end up with no symptom. Wow. And, and, that, and, and it appears that there are receptors for coronavirus, not only in lung, but also in the uh, nasal mucosa in the in the tissues around the nose and the mouth. Mm -hmm. So you know it is possible that uh, people are experienced this as a runny nose and a cold. Mm -hmm. You know, remembering that the other four types <laughs> of coronavirus, and we are we have no no four types that affect human beings. The other four types actually cause colds. Um, they in general don't cause severe disease. Though, um, those other four types, if they get going in a nursing home, um, can cause uh, a disease that has about an 8% death rate mm -hmm. in a nursing home, not in the general population, when they get into a place where there are lots of people who have diminished immunity. Yes. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I see somebody whose name is just iPad raising their hands. Um, if you if you can unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Hi, Dr. Fine. It's Adrian. Um, Hi, I'm just. Adrian. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. I'm just wondering what you're recommending for uh, us severe asthmatics. Uh, to do what you always do. Take really good care of your asthma. Use your medicines regularly. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, use the same discipline that you always use. This is not a time to run out of medicine or to okay. forget to take your medicine. And the moment you start wheezing, to call your doctor. Okay, thank you. Good to hear your voice. Yours as well. Anybody else? Yeah, good evening, Dr. Fine. This is Frank. Thank you for your time. Hi, Frank. Uh, quick question. I, um, there were two uh, good information on a sick room. Uh, just me and my wife here. We have a couple extra bedrooms, so we're actually going to prepare for that. I haven't heard that yet. So that's some really good information. So we're going to get that set up ASAP, but we're both doing good so far. Yeah. Um, my thing is, you haven't really heard on the news or any outlets about that all of us will eventually catch this. Could you tell me why they're not talking that way? Or? I, well, I, I think their version of the world is they don't want to frighten people. My version of the world is 
for most of us, this is asymptomatic or mild disease. Why don't we just tell everybody up front that that's likely to happen so that people don't get freaked out when it happens? You know, it is gonna happen. You know, most of us think, you know, at least 60 or 70% um, and likely everybody because we have no immunity. And that way it'll be like that till we've had it once or until a vaccine comes out. If, you know, something happened that surprises us and we had a vaccine come out, you know, like tomorrow and we could get everybody immunized, then we could stop this and stop it because everybody would get immune. But there are two ways to make people immune. One is vaccine and the other is to just have the disease. So it looks like our immunity will come from having the disease more than anything else. Now, what would the chances be? Uh, I stopped getting the flu shot because I get the reaction to it. Well, it's hit or miss. Some years I do, some years I don't, and I've just stopped getting it. Uh, would it be the same with this, do you think, hit or miss? Would people also get a reaction to it? Well, you know, there's a chance of getting a reaction to any vaccine. And right. some of that reaction is actually a good thing because it, it's evidence that the immune system is reacting to it. And when the immune system reacts to it, that's where you get antibodies. And that's where you get immunity. Um, so any vaccine that had no reaction would probably be a vaccine that didn't work very well. Um, you know, and I continue to strongly suggest people get flu shots every year and to differentiate, to, you know, not to get worried if you get the reaction of, you know, you get an achy arm and, and achiness and a low grade fever for a day or two, you know, that's the body reacting to the flu shot the way it should react. Now, that's a very different thing from the very few people who will get a true big allergic reaction and shock. Obviously, if you've had one of those, you don't want another flu shot. But if you get the kind of reaction I described of, you know, like your, your arm aches and you get kind of general muscle aches and then a day or two of low grade fever, you know, that would not, that should not deter you from getting the flu shot uh, because the real flu is a disease that is usually much more difficult for most of us. The real flu is five to 10 days out of commission, feeling like you've been run over by a truck. The good news is that only happens every 10 to 20 years on average for all of us, but when it happens, it's no fun. And at the same time, if you are over 65 or have other uh, medical problems, the real flu can be is dangerous to you as coronavirus is to people in that age group. Okay, well, thanks for that. Yeah, it looks like I'll get back on that flu shot then, and uh, maybe I'll just have it taken on a Friday, so I'll have the weekend to recover. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great thing. Yes, yeah, but yeah, all my life, it's been hit and miss. They say they've refined it, it's gotten better, and I went and got it, and it was great. I went the next year, and I had a 24-hour bug thing going. But um, okay, that's just great information. It's good to know. Thank you for your time, appreciate it. Great, thanks for being here. Other questions? There was a question in the chat uh, just now. Okay, which I can't see for some reason. Uh, okay. It, I saw it and then it went away. Hmm. I, can, I can read it out. It says, uh, what level of caution should we use when bringing groceries into our homes, either from shopping ourselves or having them delivered? I, 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 you know, I don't know how to answer that honestly. Um, the likelihood of, of virus coming that way seems a little small, um, but there's, you know, there's sort of no downside to wiping things off um, as you put them away. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I, 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 you've got to eat. And, uh, you know, I, the other thing I think people have tried is putting groceries leaving groceries in, the, in their bags for a day or two. Understanding that the virus seems to last only about 24 hours on paper or cardboard. It lasts as many as 72 hours on cardboard or metal surfaces. So, you know, I mean, if there are things that aren't perishable, um, if you wanted to be cautious, you could just leave them in their bags or boxes 
um, and put them to the side for two or three days and then unpack them. That's a strategy that ought to work. But remember, I'm the guy who thinks we're all gonna get this. So as far as I'm concerned, I might as well get it and get it over with. I'm not, I'm not perhaps inappropriate, but inappropriately, I'm not afraid of getting it because I'm gonna get it regardless of what I do. And I think the challenge is to make it so that not everybody gets it at once. And that's why we're being so cautious. Other questions? I, I can't raise my hand, so I'll speak. Good. Um, I believe you said earlier, if we have some sort of symptom, um, we should wear a mask. So for instance, if it seems like I'm having allergy, it might not be allergy, it might be that, so I, I should wear a mask? Well, here's the recommendation. We don't really have recommend, a recommendation for simple allergies, though, you know, there are some people who would say, uh, if you develop those simple allergies, you should wear a mask and go into one of the, you know, go into that little hibernation room for a week. Mm. Um, you know, I think you kind of have to play it by ear. The only thing that you're going to accomplish in that environment is uh, not spreading it so much. Um, but the, uh, Sorry, sorry about the ringing phone. Um, the, uh, anyhow, uh, the, uh, the standard recommendation is that you get a, uh, a, if you get a fever and a cough, mm. that's when you should head to an isolation room and put a mask on and stay in that isolation room. For seven days there's actually a another recommendation and that is when you get a fever or cough not only should you go into that isolation room or hibernation room um, your family should stay in the house and not go out for 14 days to see if one of them gets sick oh right yes uh, and that is that is the current recommendation at this time okay thank you Any other questions? Catherine, should we thank everybody for coming? What's I your think, pleasure? I think, yeah. Oh, oh, somebody just unmuted themselves. So let's give them one second. Yeah. Um, hi, Dr. Fine. It's Catherine. So <laughs> I. I, of course, look to Japan and Hong Kong and those places, and I had been feeling sort of heartened that things were getting better. Um, but it seems like it's second cycle. Um, is it wrong to still feel like things are okay because the second wave will be less than the first wave? Or I don't know. Am I being overly optimistic? Um, I actually don't think we really know yet. Okay. Uh, the there will be a second wave if not everybody gets it soon. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second wave will be in people who aren't immune yet, who haven't had it yet. Mm -hmm. um, what we're expecting here is what I call a sputtering epidemic, where we get going. You know, now we're doing all this social distancing, um, mm -hmm. and hopefully that will drop the number of new cases after, and it's likely to take 10 or 12 or 14 weeks before uh, we can loosen up the restrictions, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and then after we loosen the restrictions and people start moving around, we'll see small outbreaks, small numbers of new cases, and then we'll need the public health process to come and contain those new cases sometimes by isolation and contact tracing, sometimes by uh, uh, re reinstituting um, these social distancing measures. 
Now it's okay. one, one thing, actually I, I didn't mention one thing that's useful for people to know. I can't, I don't know for sure this is going to happen. The way they shut this down in China, mm -hmm. um, which they did in the city of Wuhan, mm -hmm. was they, they took everyone who was symptomatic, coughing in a fever and positive for the virus. And they brought them out of their houses and took them to what they called an isolation hospital. Mm -hmm. And they spent a couple of weeks in the isolation hospital until they were fully recovered and their uh, tests were negative. That meant they spent a couple of weeks away from their families. Um, and that, you know, if we do it here, I think will be very difficult for people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the way we got things under control in China. And actually, if you go back into history, it's the way we got things under control for tuberculosis. Yeah, yep, uh, the most, sanatoriums. <laughs> yeah, most people don't remember mm. that Zamborano and Memorial Hospital right, right, were, right. got their start as tuberculosis hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually built hospitals specifically to isolate people. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't shock me if we do that again. You know, until, until we get a vaccine, once we get a vaccine and get the population vaccinated, then we are okay for this disease. We just have to make sure we don't forget the lessons of this disease uh, because there will be another one. Absolutely. Um, and I am just hoping and praying that we all learn something. Uh, we have a fairly short memory. Yes. And the question is whether we will understand what we need to do differently in order to protect the population for when the next one gets here. And you know, you don't know, but it's possible the next one could be worse. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Thank you, always good to see you and hear from you. Same here. Uh, somebody in the chat asked, um, is there any thought that warmer temperatures will help diminish the strength of the virus or its spread? Actually, there's some evidence from influenza that suggests that's possible. Turns out that influenza spreads best in cold temperatures. Um, and it's a very obscure reason that I never would have thought of myself. It appears that these diseases that are spread by respiratory droplets. You know, when somebody coughs or sneezes, there are tiny little droplets of virus and water that leaves. Um, in cold temperatures, it's also dry. And the dryness dries out the droplets. The water evaporates. And that leaves the viral particles drifting in the air um, and are in the air for someone to inhale if someone walks by. In warm, war in warm uh, moist climates, that same droplet doesn't lose water, it actually takes on water and it becomes heavy and falls to the ground and isn't as transmissible. So there is logic to the notion that the warm weather may improve it, but there's no guarantee. We remember, we're seeing this particular virus for the first time and we are going to have to learn as we go, studying it every single day before we can answer all the questions that are being asked definitively with, a good, with good science. Thank you, that's actually a really cool answer. <laughs> Isn't it a good, cool story? Yeah. yeah. Um, does anybody else have questions? So I have a request um, and a bit of a story. Ebola in Liberia was stopped not by doctors in hospitals, um, not by medicines or vaccines. It was actually stopped by the process of community organizing. Um, there was an org uh, 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 there is an organization called Partners in Health that went to Liberia and worked with people in their communities, helped people understand how transmission happened and how to stay safe. And when people in their communities changed their behavior, that stopped the transmission of Ebola. 
CDC recommended, or second, CDC predicted that Ebola would kill 1.4 million people in Liberia, a nation of 4 million people, inside of four months. But then this organization, this community organizing process began, um, and uh, Ebola unfortunately killed 10,000 people, but 10,000 people, not 1.4 million. And I am hoping that we could get people in situate to talk to each other, particularly about what I talked about in terms of creating a hibernation or an isolation or a sick room. Get ready, assume that they're gonna get the disease and then help each other learn how to move into that sick room when one of us gets sick. And I'm hoping that if we do that and do that together, we could get a much better outcome than, they, than they've had in New York. So this is just a gentle hint. Um, <laughs> and if there's any interest in doing that organization, I have uh, written this, you know, sort of seven or eight simple points that suggest to people how they might approach this that I'm happy to share with Catherine um, for circulation. And, you know, what we're doing in Central Falls is a series of Zoom meetings that are really there to help people transmit the information. So, you know, we're, with, after one Zoom meeting, we ask everyone who came to the Zoom meeting to send us the names of a couple of people to invite to the next Zoom meeting. Um, so we do this in a linked way and use Zoom as a kind of community organizing tool. So just a hint for situ. All right. Um, also, I, uh, I've been recording this and I will be posting it uh, on our Facebook and our YouTube channel. So if you just want to share the information that we had tonight with somebody, there will be links for that pretty soon. I'll send it to you tonight. <laughs> Just want to give everyone a chance to okay <laughs> me again <laughs> good <laughs> um is there a thought as to when a a vaccine will be ready available viable however there's a hope mm -hmm. most people are predicting nine to 12 months maybe 18 months mm -hmm. um, nobody knows for sure you know, they can't make it happen. You know, they, they're working on it every second. Oh, yes. But there are no guarantees about how long it will take. I won't be first in line for it. I'm, I'm like you. I think I'll just get it and go through it. I may even have it now. Who knows? I, I think that's true of all of us. Mm. But, that was very enlightening. Well, thank you. Um, if nobody else has anything else to say, I think we can wrap up. Great. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Thanks again. Talk to you all soon. Yes. Thank, thank you. Stay safe. You also. You don't too. Make seven, don't make seven masks. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night.